Hello, today we will be looking at the poem Songs of Soro by Coffee Avenue. George Coffee Avenue Williams was a poet from Ghana whose words were deeply rooted in his native Awe tradition. He often lamented the westernized African's laws of identity and turned to the oral tradition of his village for inspiration. In his poetry, he tried to incorporate and combine the various strands of his native literature with that of modern poetic forms. Now, if you take a look at his major works, his first published collection of poetry was Rediscovery and Other Poems that came out in 1964. This was followed by Night of My Blood that came out in 1971, Write Me Memory that was published in 1973, The House by the Sea that was published in 1978, and Latin American and Caribbean Notebook that came out in 1992. The Promise of Hope, New and Selected Poems, 1964 to 2013, was published posthumously in 2014. A short introduction to the poem, Songs of Sorrow. The poem is modeled like an African dirge in the tradition of Awe. So this is drastically different from the Western dirge. The form is different. The structure is different. The poem depicts a man who is troubled by the misfortunes caused by the unrelenting fate that is dogging his footsteps. It looks at the tribulations of life and the seminal role played by ancestors in determining one's fate. It is marked by a tone of uh, pessimism and the poetic persona contemplates the inevitability of fate. Now let's move on to a detailed analysis of the poem. Zogby's Lisa has treated me thus. It has led me among the shafts of the forest. Returning is not possible and going forward is a great difficulty. The affairs of this world are like chameleon feces into which I have stepped. When I clean, it can go. The poet begins by suggesting the possibility of an ancestral curse. And Zogby's Lisa is probably an ancestor. So the speaker or the poetic persona is sure that the current or the present misfortunes have been brought about by that unfortunate curse. The curse that Zogby's Lisa or other ancestors have put on him. This curse has led him towards the innumerable misfortunes in life. He seems to be stuck in his situation. It is impossible to wish for a return because he says returning is not possible. Why? The past is a closed door that no one can access. And going forward, he says, is a great difficulty. At the same time, it is difficult to envisage a happy future as life is a difficult road to traverse. It is unpredictable. The speaker is doubtful of its uh, smooth continuity. In the very next line, the poet depicts a very startling image associated with worldly problems. He says that worldly problems, the matters of this world, they are like chameleon feces, sticky and vile. And when you try to evade it, when you try to escape it, it clings on to you. It just won't let you go. So the image again stresses the motive of uh, fatalism that runs throughout the poem. One cannot really entertain the possibility of escape as such an option may not be feasible. And remember that this motive of fatalism was something that was very common in African tradition. I am on the world's extreme corner. I am not sitting in the row with the imminent, but those who are lucky sit in the middle and forget. I am on the world's extreme corner. I can only go beyond and forget. So here he is talking about the kind of uh, social or class uh, divides that we have in our society. Okay? So in terms of social stratification, the speaker assumes that he's in the world's extreme corner, which is a rather unfavorable position. His life is not uh, intermingled with the lives of the famous or the distinguished people who sit in the front row. He brands himself as unlucky as he believes that 
the lucky people are the ones who sit in the middle they may not be in the front but they are in the middle they are not towards the uh, other end the extreme end they sit in the middle and forget the world's worries that are forced on the unlucky ones as far as the uh, poetic persona is concerned he is situated right on the edge and his only option is to take the plunge into the beyond and forget his misfortunes so he suggests that he has been cornered by the world and his life is marked by misfortunes my people i have been somewhere if i turn here the rain beats me if i turn there the sun burns me the firewood of this world is for only those who can take heart that is why not all can gather it the world is not good for anybody but you are so happy with your fate alas the travelers are back all covered with debt the speaker addresses his people my people why does he do that because they all face the same fate life doesn't provide easy options or solutions and uh, in the next line you see the images of rain and sun okay so these images are used to symbolize the hardships that are natural to human life if i turn here the rain beats me if i turn there the sun burns me so wherever i turn i am troubled by the natural elements the idea is that no matter how far one runs one cannot escape the various misfortunes that life throws in one's path the firewood uh, is suggestive of the fuel that is required to live a life it could be fame it could be eminence luck fortune okay it could be any of these things only the brave can collect this firewood as they have to overcome a number of hurdles in their quest to collect this firewood the speaker argues that not all men are born lucky okay not all men are born with such luck only those who attain this luck can become powerful and those people who have power can become successful so it is a long line okay lucky uh, powerful and then successful so you can say that you know he paints a rather pessimistic and gloomy picture of life when he says that the world is not a good place those who journeyed ahead to search for glory have returned as tired travelers covered in debt even those adventurers those who went ahead to you know make their fortune they have come back they had gone ahead to make a better life for themselves but they have failed in their endeavors they have failed in their adventures they are now covered with the ignominy of shame and this this suggests the unpredictability of life you cannot you can never predict whether you know you will go ahead and be successful you can always go ahead try to seek your luck but in the end you might just fail so life doesn't guarantee you a certain happiness because you might fail in your adventure and come back as a tired traveler something has happened to me the thing so great that i cannot weep i have no sons to fire the gun when i die and no daughters to wail when i close my mouth i have wandered on the wilderness the great wilderness men call life the rain has beaten me and the sharp stumps cut as keen as knives i shall go beyond and rest i have no kin and no brother death has made war upon our house the speaker now hints at a great tragedy or sorrow that has befallen him this tragedy is so immense as far as he is considered so huge that it has robbed him of his capacity to cry he is numb with sorrow and cannot express his agony and then he reveals the reason for this despair family is perhaps the greatest strength of men and both ancestors and progeny are equally important now his sadness his agony arises because of the fact that 
he has no sons or daughters to perform his last rituals and you have to remember that this was considered to be a great disgrace in african tradition no sons will fire the gun for him no daughters will cry on his grave and then he goes on to the metaphor of life as wilderness and this metaphor becomes the extension of uh, the imagery that was used in the previous dancer he finds himself lost in the wilderness of life as there is no family to guide him and fortify him and then he says the rain has beaten me and the sharp stones cut as keen as knives so rain and sharp stones are elements of nature and the natural world become weapons for the man who is bereft of family who has no family it has taken away his courage and strength and he believes that there is nothing more left for him in this world he seeks to embrace death that is why he says i shall go beyond and rest okay he wants to embrace death so that he can go and seek eternal rest the speaker again highlights his loneliness when he says i have no kin and no brother death has declared war on his house and all his family has been taken away and he says that the family will soon crumble as no one can stand before death and the family has already crumbled there is nobody left in his house and kipete's great household is no more only the broken fence stands and those who dared not look in his face have come out as men how well their pride is with them let those gone before take note they have treated their offspring badly what is the wailing for somebody is dead agosu himself alas a snake has bitten me my right arm is broken and the tree on which i lean is fallen the poet mourns the loss of kipeti who is probably a kinsman or a tribesman whose entire family has perished the great family of kipeti has now been reduced to a broken fence symbolic of disuse and by association death in the past kipeti was such a fierce figure that many were scared to look him in the face but now with the passage of time those people have emerged to be the new fierce warriors they are all proud of their accomplishments but the poet asks do they realize that all this is transient because it could be you today and someone else tomorrow the speaker says that such tragedy has risen because the ancestors did not bless their future generations and then he hears a sad cry he says what is the wailing for and then he finds the reason for the sad cry he realizes that death has claimed yet another kinsman and this is agosu himself the speaker's sorrow at agosu's death is very sharp he feels the pain as intensely as a snake bite or a broken arm because agosu was that dear to him agosu's death is compared to all the great misfortunes that he can think of he believes that he is also falling down as the presence on which he has leaned for support is now no more agosi if you go tell them tell nideru kipeti and kove that they have done us evil tell them their house is falling and the trees in the fens have been eaten by termites that the martels curse them ask them why they idle there while we suffer and eat sand and the crow and the vulture hover always above our broken fences and strangers walk over our portion the speaker addresses his friend agosi and says now that you are going to the world of the dead tell our ancestors nideru kipeti and kove that they have brought this evil on the family the family is dying and this is 
indicative of a lack of benediction. The family or clan is on the verge of destruction and the image of tree is suggestive of family and life, the image of trees. And the trees in the fens have been eaten by termites. So the image of termites slowly destroying a tree is symbolic of a clan on the verge of extinction. The speaker doesn't understand why the ancestors are not interceding on their behalf and helping them. Their idleness is rather cruel as the living are now suffering. So instead of bounteous, plentiful food, what do they get? They eat sand. Their mouths are filled with sand. And this is yet another image that suggests death. Both crow and vulture are considered to be ominous birds, birds of ill luck. And the idea is that bad luck is slowly circling them. It is hovering around their heads. They cannot flourish. They cannot come up in life. And strangers are now claiming what is entitled to them. Strangers walk over their portion. So the speaker wants the ancestors to not withhold their blessings anymore. And one can view the poem as a petition or plea to the ancestors. I hope all of you understood the poem. Thank you.